A new patient group in Right Chat Nation. Welcome inside the broadcast booth. Brian Wright here, and welcome into the third episode of Season 7. Episode 96 overall, the new patient group podcast. We keep rolling along. Hope your Q1 of 2024 is going great out there. Today, we're going to be diving into a really important leadership lesson. This is one of my favorite ones to teach. I love teaching our customers this. I love talking about it on stage. And it's trust versus performance. And it's all around the leadership style of the Navy SEALs Team 6. All right, we're also going to be taking that lesson and we're going to be talking about what most likely is your biggest mistake with your leadership hires inside your practice and how you're looking at leadership probably a little bit differently than you should in order to get the most out of your people and the most out of your organization while also lessening the burden, the stress, and a lot of the chaos that is put on you as a business owner and a lot of times is put on other people in your organization that is not necessary. Today's going to be a great lesson in leadership that is going to domino effect into so many other aspects of your organization if you take this to heart and go implement it. Going to have a great one. Have some really cool updates for you on the other side. Again, I think I said it a couple podcasts ago. It's amazing what happens over the course of just 30 days. <laughs> it's really incredible. So I'm going to kind of bring you into our world a little bit, let you know what's going on, and got some cool updates, like I said, for you on the other side. Before we get started, let's fire up the music. Welcome aboard the new patient group flight deck. Less chaos. Check. Less stress. Check. Less advertising costs. Check. More personal and financial freedom. Ah. Check. All right. Business checklist completed. Let the takeoff roll begin. Welcome to Season 7 of the New Patient Group Audio Experience, a podcast dedicated to forward-thinking doctors wanting to learn innovative ways to run their business today so your practice can achieve new heights tomorrow. And now your host, he's the founder and CEO of New Patient Group, managing partner of Right Chat, and a trusted motivational speaker for Invisalign, OrthoFi, and others. Brian Wright. Hey, everybody. Welcome in out there. A quick shout out. Dr. Sean Carlson is opening up at, after a lot of hard work. Sean, I want to give you a shout out, man. He is opening up Simple Orthodontics. And that practice is really one that represents so much of what we teach on here and what I believe not only the now, but certainly the future of the practices. So many residents listen to this podcast coming out and Everybody, don't make the mistake of opening up practices that require a massive team or eight chairs. And so many of the, the older ways of what used to just be the norm. And I think somewhat you've got to get your ego out of the way because by doing it the way Sean is doing it, doing it the way we teach on here, you kind of going to have to push the ego aside because if you go to the AAO as an example or you bring your team to, to new patient group, MPG Iconic, or whatever the event is out there, you know, kind of the old way was pound the chest and I've got this big team and they're all wearing my t-shirts and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not the way anymore. Uh, the way now is, is using outsource partners that are going to be better at doing it most of the time than your people and reduce all those headaches that come with people and people leaving and coming aboard and all the, the, just the, the wash, rinse, repeat cycle that we all deal with with small businesses or large businesses for that matter. And it's the new way. And Sean, props to you, man. It's been a lot of hard work. Uh, I appreciate you being part of the MPG and Right Chat uh, customer family and uh, looking forward to supporting you in your ongoing needs and this overall venture you have. So props, props to Sean Carlson. Open up Simple Orthodontics. I think it's the way of the future. You're going to be great, man. Uh, can't wait to come in there and hang out with you and see it now that you've, you've built it up and, and opened the location. I talked about that for a couple of reasons. One, the obvious, I wanted to give, wanted to give Sean some props because he's worked his butt off for it. But the other is that we have a sponsor of the March New Patient Group podcast today, and it's OrthoFi. This is something we have had several companies come to us in the past and want to sponsor the podcast or sponsor a webinar that we've done, whatever it may be. They know we have a loyal following, a niche following. Uh, they know that a lot of times our following does what we teach. And they wanted to take advantage of that. And our answer has been over and over, no, we're not going to do it. We do not water down our brand to chase money on here. Does everybody want money? Hopefully, hopefully your answer is yes, we certainly do. But we're not going to water down our brand 
uh, by having a lack of integrity, by just taking any company that wants to hand us a check. Uh, the one that wanted to do it today, though, I'm a big believer in. And OrthoFi is sponsoring the March episode and some really cool things. You know, if you're a if you're a practice that is still stuck in the old days, you have analog based paperwork in any form or fashion whatsoever. That could be that you're mailing out or emailing a PDF that somebody has to print and you're having issues with people filling out paperwork accurately and early before their arrival. If you're having if you're having issues verifying insurance accurately and early, uh, if you are having uh, conversion issues on the TC side of things and not getting enough people to say yes, if you're a practice that wants to charge more while also being more affordable, uh, if you're a practice that wants to get more of your pending list, the ones that said, let me think about it back through the door, if you want to get more sign at homes while you're sitting there having a cocktail on the beach and you're looking at your phone, you just get a notification, hey, we just signed somebody at home. If you're a practice that doesn't have that ability, let me just talk about that for just a second because I know practices like this. And not only are you not taking records by scanning with the iTero at the first appointment, then you're making them also manually you know, come back to sign paperwork. They are not going to start with you, most likely, if you're a practice in those conditions. You have to have the ability to give people a, a easy, convenient way to digitally just sign at home. And you will just from that right there, you will get multiple more starts a month. I see it with our customers with OrthoFi. They all do better on the pending list and getting more starts at home. It's just that simple. And it's just something that you've got to commit to just doing things differently. Uh, your OBS list, when Joey is not ready for treatment, the OBS is a disaster inside practices. One of my favorite features of OrthoFi is just the digitalization of that OBS and pending list and the automation that a lot of it comes with. Uh, their payment slider. I think a lot of people look at OrthoFi as the payment slider company, and it goes so far above and beyond what it can do for you. It can enhance the patient experience. It can enhance the conversion on the new patient phone call from just being able to edify things that other practices don't have the ability to edify. So it makes you stand out and be unique prior to them even coming through the door. I see our customers that use our online marketing. We help them do tons of video marketing around just the affordability and the technological advancement and so many different things that OrthoFi allows the practice to do to be different than the other two, three, four, five opinions. Uh, it is an amazing company. And again, like if, if you're a practice that has been thinking about using OrthoFi, now's a great time and announce a nice uh, partnership promotion with them here in just a second. But if you're a practice that's been thinking about it, maybe you haven't heard uh, great things, maybe. Maybe you're a practice using it now and you're not succeeding with it or a past practice. Look, the reality is you have to use all the tools. You have to use the tools right. You've got to be a compliant customer. And when you do, OrthoFi is an absolute no-brainer for the practice. Their founder, Dr. Jamie Reynolds, is a customer of ours with New Patient Group and Right Chat. Uh, they are big believers in us. We are big believers in them. And I'm proud to announce them sponsoring this podcast. And we have a great offer for you if you are a practice that has been considering this. And this could be, hey, look, uh, I don't have... Uh, an employee to handle some of this stuff on their own. I'm having massive conversion issues. Uh, again, I, I'm analog based on my paperwork. You have high turnover, whatever it may be. Look, OrthoFi can change the game for your practice. I want you to give them a chance. And right now is a great time. Just make sure you mention my name, Brian Wright, and one of my companies, New Patient Group or Right Chat, whenever you do, and you're going to get $3,500, $3,500 off their implementation fee. So a great offering to jump aboard with them right now. Also, if you're a non right Chat customer as it stands today, when you bring aboard OrthoFi, you're also going to get a month free of onboarding with right Chat, and we're also going to answer your new patient calls for you for one month so you can test out that service, listen to the calls, see our digital dashboard, and see what a game changer it can be for your practice. So a great partnership. Also, Lastly, New Patient Group, we're going to do a free online marketing audit for your practice when you come aboard with OrthoFi as part of this, this implementation and this partnership offer from OrthoFi. So great time to act. Speaking of OrthoFi, so we've been doing this now for a few years. And at the AAO, we're doing a pre-arrival, or excuse me, a pre-AAO uh, masterclass workshop. And we've been doing it for a few years now. Every year it's changed. A few years ago, 
Uh, Dr. Bob Skopak and I did it uh, last year. It was Dr. Jamie Reynolds, his TC, Danielle Oliver, and myself. This year, it's going to be Oliver and me, and we're going to be talking about so many cool things on transforming the overall new patient journey, as well as what happens after they buy. So many things that represent on how to be a people business first, and this is open to your team. Uh, You're already going to AAO. If you're already going, make sure to come early and join us for that Friday masterclass. We want to pack the house. It is good for all your team members So bring them in, take notes, have a great, uh, have a great time. You're going to learn amazing things from us. And so excited to be doing that masterclass uh, with somebody that I consider a friend of mine and highly respect in the business world, uh, Oliver from from OrthoFi. Remember, next month, March 21st, I am going to be launching our first national fireside CEO chat. And we're going to be doing these every three months moving forward. And that is our very first one on March 21st. First is going to be with Dr. Bob Skopak, and he is a longtime customer and very good friend of mine. And we're going to be doing something around the topic of Blue Ocean Orthodontics. If you have not familiar, if you're not familiar with the Blue Ocean book, uh, so just go and, and listen to the audio book or grab it and read it. And it's going to be a really cool concept that we're going to be talking about that is very, very outside the box from how the majority of the industry thinks. Uh, Bob Skopak, I consider somebody that has taken you know, the outsource model and making something that is oftentimes very chaotic inside the practice into something very simple. And, and it is a beautiful thing to watch his practice function in just such an efficient, efficient way. That's going to be an awesome one. I'm going to put all the registration links in the podcast description below. So for that, that webinar, the national fireside chat that I just talked about with Bob Skopak, That registration link will be in the podcast description. As far as the promotion goes uh, with OrthoFi, I will put some more information with that in the podcast description. And then I will also put the registration link to the pre-AAO workshop with Oliver and I, our masterclass. I'll put that registration link in the podcast description below as well. And hope uh, we pack the house for that one and also pack the house for the webinar uh, with Bob Skopak. What I'm going to start doing every three months when we start doing this is I'm going to start transforming those into the following month's podcast. So in April, next month, uh, the podcast will be with Bob Skopak and I around the topic of the webinar we are doing. And then we will go another three months, we're going to launch another one. And then that following month, that will be the podcast as well. I'm going to start integrating some more guests on here, just kind of shake things up, keep it fresh. I think I mentioned that either last podcast or the podcast before. So a lot of great things going on. I hope everyone is doing great out there. And let's dive in. Going to be talking about this Navy SEALs Team 6 and what is their leadership style? How do they go about looking at leadership and the positions in their organization? And we're going to tie this into trust versus performance today. And there's, there's a kind of a quadrant system that the Navy SEALs Team 6 uses that I'm going to be describing today. If you're watching on our YouTube station, I'm going to put some screenshots of what I'm talking about over it so you get an actual visual. Hopefully, as I talk about it to the podcast listeners out there listening, uh, hopefully I will paint the proper image in your mind uh, through the words that I use today. And it's something really cool because it's so different than how so many of you out there just go about uh, putting people in the quote unquote leadership positions. I view just the leadership positions inside so many of your practices out there as as a as a I don't want to call it a failure. I just want to call it a real problem. Like if if you are a business that was out in the the real entrepreneur world where you had to run it at a high level in order to make money, which you've heard me say a lot of, a lot of times on here, a lot of you are still very lucky where you can have so many holes in your organization yet still bring home a half a million dollars a year or even a million dollars a year. But those times continually shift towards more and more you having to be a business owner and a real entrepreneur as your first priority in order to succeed in orthodontics. And the more commoditization that happens, uh, the more competition, air quotes, that happen, uh, the more these things become absolutely critical to your success. I have seen so many, you know, just the other day, we're on with with a practice that we recently brought aboard. and, And they're a large organization, and we have our very first meeting with them, and the office managers are on there, 
And, you know, er- Eric and I were, were delivering our parts to onboard them. And, you know, you're trying to give all these inspirational speeches. And as I teach on here, as well as my other podcast, The Brian Wright Show, you know, there are people, no matter what you do, no matter what you coach, no matter how motivational, no matter how inspirational, no matter how good you are at what you're trying to teach, there are people that simply don't give a damn. And unfortunately, these are the same people in life that think that people that end up being more successful than them should be taxed more, or people that are more successful than them are just lucky, or whatever it may be. These are the people that also are always asking for pay raises, and they're always complaining about things instead of looking in the mirror. And we're on, and and as a speaker, and this is it's easier whenever you're on stage, one, to, to motivate and get people excited Uh, But something that you notice on stage very easily is body language. Like you can tell, okay, people are digging this. This is going really great. Like, let's keep it up. Or you can tell, oh boy, this isn't going very good. Like I need to kind of pick it up. I need to change my delivery. I need to figure something out to get the crowd engaged. And on webinars, it's just, it can be harder. But over time, we've done so many of these Zoom sessions that you can you can tell who's engaged. You can tell who's paying attention, blah, blah, blah. Well, with this practice, it kind of goes into what I've been seeing for so many years inside so many practices out there is that the leadership team aren't leaders at all. Like I'm sitting there looking at a group of people that are supposed to be engaged and they're not taking notes. They're talking to each other. They're goofing off. Uh, they're not paying any attention. They're typing on their computer while we're talking. Like there's zero engagement or very little engagement from the people that are supposed to be on the team that is engaged the most in order to make other people better. And that wasn't happening at all. And in so many of your organizations out there, you are taking positions. And a perfect example. This is something that I think all of you that listen can relate to. It's a perfect example. So you have a clinical lead in the back. Why is that person, we'll just use the name Betty. Why is Betty your clinical lead? And your answer that you're probably telling yourself right now is, well, Betty's been there the longest. She knows what I expect on the clinical side. She knows the protocols. Her hand skills are probably good. These are probably the things that you're saying to yourself right now. Like I can trust her. She's got the right instruments set up. Blah, 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 right? That's the answer most of you have on why Betty is the clinical lead. And for sports fans out there, and you know I like the sports analogies because there are so many things that make sports organizations who are good year in and year out, regardless of turnover, regardless of of just the uncontrollables. They may not win the whole thing, but every year going in, they're good. And we know like in the NFL, the, the NHL, uh, major the MLB, Major League Baseball, and the NBA, there are teams, and there's exceptions. It's not that they don't have down years, but for the majority of that, there are teams that are really good, or at least good, year in and year out. And if you take the sports analogy and you look at the coaching staff, who becomes normally, again, there's exceptions, but this is the rare exception in sports, who becomes the greatest coaches? And if you look at who becomes the greatest coaches in sports, rarely to ever is it the superstar player. Rarely to ever is it that player that's got the, the, the hand skills, that knows the clinical stuff, all the things that I just described a minute ago. Rarely is that person become the leader of the team from a coaching standpoint. Who are the great coaches if you look back over history? Well, the majority of them are role players. They may even have been bench players that really never even got into the game. And obviously, everybody's a great player if you get into any professional sport whatsoever. But once you're there, then you have different layers, right? You have not so good players. You've got average players. You've got good players. And then you've got the superstars. And the coaches, if you go back throughout history again, are ones that oftentimes couldn't even get into the game at the professional level. There's even some great coaches that never even played at the professional level, that are great coaches at the professional level. And you sit there and you start asking yourself, um, why? Why is that the case? 
And and the answer in lies what we're going to be talking about today in trust versus performance, the Navy SEALs Team 6, and this quadrant system, this graph system on what they use in order to determine, one, who they're even going to bring aboard in their organization, but also who is going to be the leaders in their organization. And this is really today going to flip so many things that you are doing inside the practice on its head. And I think so far today, a lot of you out there are probably nodding your head. Yeah, that, that is how you, know, you take a clinical lead and, and Betty back there, you know, that is why I have her there. And, and what we're going to be diving into today, and, and it's proof of, of what we teach, because the Navy SEALs Team 6, if you're not familiar with, I'm sure everybody out there is familiar with, with the Navy SEALs. The Navy SEALs Team 6 is like the Mission Impossible Tom Cruise team of the Navy SEALs. It's like the Navy SEALs is unbelievable, the best of the best, but then the Navy SEALs Team 6 is like a whole nother world above them. Like, these are like the freak shows of the freak shows. I mean, they are nutso. If you dive into Google and just look at some of the things they do and the training commitment that they are committed to, it is off the charts amazing. And you think of the Navy SEALs and the Team 6, and on the surface in your mind, you're probably thinking, okay, you know, you've got people and the way they're going to bring aboard people, you know, they're going to bring aboard the strongest people and they're going to bring aboard people that are full of confidence and they're going to bring aboard people that they can trust to know that whenever, uh, you know, Joey is hurt out in the battlefield, uh, you know, Susie or Tommy or Chris or whatever is going to be able to get out there in the battlefield and pull them off and save their life. And I think on the surface, that is probably how most people perceive the Navy SEALs Team 6 is overall philosophies of who makes it, who stays and who moves into leadership positions. And as you dive in, the really cool thing is, is none of what I just said is the case whatsoever. Muscle and strength and confidence and the ability to yank Susie off the battlefield if if she gets shot or whatever it may be, or dive deep into the water and hold their breath long enough to get cross battle lines, to get into a position, to be able to nail nail the person that we're fighting. None of that is the, the criteria of the Navy SEALs Team 6. So the question is, how do they do it? And let's dive into that. And I think a lot of you, you know, not only is this going to help you have a different outlook on how you are looking at your leadership roles in your office, how you are, how are you are hiring and promoting for those roles, but also just in general, what are the type of people you're hiring? And, and so many of you out there, and, and I've done podcasts throughout the years around this topic, uh, I'm going to be revisiting them because I like the way we look at it better today than we did seven years ago as an example. I like the way we teach it. But so many of you are trying to, to hire people that you don't have to train, right? That person that's been in the dental profession, orthodontic profession for so, so long as an example, and they've got... 25 years of assisting experience, and they've been answering the phone for 15 years. And you think that by doing that, you're just going to plug them into your organization and reduce the amount of training you have. And I will sit here and tell you, it's a horrible way to look at it. It's a lazy way to look at it. And I will also tell you that I think you are increasing your workload by doing that and placing way more stress in your team. And, And I think that when I talk about what we're diving into now, I think you're going to have light bulbs popping on all over the place saying, holy shit, this is my office. Like, oh my God, I've got to, I've got to do something different. You know, one of the, one of the, the podcasts I have at some point is, is around, is around leadership and the most ironic thing about your leadership positions. And I'm going to touch on it a bit today. It's not the topic today, but I am going to touch on it a bit. You know, leadership, it's, it's an interesting thing. If, if you look at, you take whatever, you take a sales role and it's a sales role for whatever, let's say Invisalign or for OrthoFly or for dental monitoring or for whatever, uh, you know, a restaurant supply company, whatever it may be. If you look at the leadership positions and people that are in those leadership positions, we have a real problem because we are creating managers 
We are creating bosses who are not leaders whatsoever. You look at the criteria, kind of like earlier on, I said, you know, look at your office. Who's your clinical lead in the back? And it most likely fits the description of they've been there a long time. They've got good hand skills. They know what you like. They know how to set up trays. You, you know, they know your protocols, things like that, right? And it's the same way of of a lot of people in these sales these sales examples that I'm given right now is that you take somebody that's maybe been in your organization for you know whatever call it ten years um, they are always putting out better sales numbers or consistently putting out better sales numbers than other people on their team so what happens well most likely what happens in in your organization those listening out there again execs with these companies we speak for and others is that you then move them into a position where they're now in charge of the team who's in charge of your customer, right? In charge of the sale, in charge of also following up with previous people that they did sell. And you look at that person and you look at your sales team and you ask yourself, how much training do they get? And you go, well, they get a ton. Like uh, Johnson & Johnson is an example. Like they train their people beyond, it's where Align Technology, makers of Invisalign, a lot of their hires come from Johnson & Johnson because what a rigorous training process it is around sales and other important key components of being good at your job that Johnson & Johnson puts you through. And then Align Technology, amazing sales training, really trains their people. People get a lot of good things that they can go out and use in the field to be able to grow sales. But what happens once you promote this person that is consistently putting out better sales numbers than everybody else? What happens? The training stops. Right, so now you've got a person that is the most, they're in the most important role that they've ever been in in their entire career, and there's no training for that. And this is how we get, or very little training for that. And this is how we are creating managers and bosses inside so many organizations, just like many of your practices out there. The people that are in leadership roles, they are more, and this goes to a lot of people's heads, they are more in a position of rank a position of title, a position of power, then they are a leader at all whatsoever. And you're going to see that as I dive in. And imagine, so, so the Navy SEALs Team 6, imagine a graph. You've got a line going up horizontally, and then you've got a line matching it going across, or excuse me, the first line going up vertically, and the second line going across horizontally, and they match. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see my hands, right? So you've got performance, and you've got trust. And performance represents exactly what it talks about. It, it's trust on the battlefield, right? It's, it's skill sets on the battlefield, and, and things like that. Then you've got trust going across the bottom, and let, let me kind of break this down easier. Performance is, can I trust you with my life? Right? Trust going across the bottom again, and you can see the screenshot on YouTube. Trust going across the bottom is, can I trust you with my wife? Right. So you have performance that is on the battlefield, and you have trust going across the bottom, which is off the battlefield. So you can see the difference, right? We've got one on the baseball field. We've got one on the practice whenever patients are coming through the door. We've got one on the basketball court. And then you've got the trust performance, which is the locker room, the clubhouse in baseball, the locker room in basketball and football, uh, the, the lunch room inside a lot of your offices out there, right? When we take our, our lunch break or our 10 minute morning meeting before people, you know, what, before you start seeing patients, these are things that are off your battlefield. And that is that trust component. And I think earlier, I'm kind of rethinking some thoughts here. I think earlier I may have brought up the word when I said performance with that, that vertical line. I brought up trust uh, then, and that, that's, not the, that's not the case. I'm not sure if I did or not, but I'm just kind of rethinking my thoughts. And, and, and again, if I did, that's not the case. Performance, vertical line, that is on the battlefield. Trust, horizontal line, that is off the battlefield. Right now, there are several components to this that are that are really key to to honing in on how the best of the best look at these positions and how you need to rethink how you've been hiring and looking at these positions. So if you've got the performance going up, trust going across, in the lower left-hand corner, 
we have low performer, low trust, right? That's the person that they, they suck at their job and they suck with the team, right? They, they, they're a bad baseball player and they're bad with their teammates inside the clubhouse. No organization, and this is, I think, easy to convince, convince everybody. No organization wants that person. Right? Nobody wants the person that, that sucks at their job and also sucks with their teammate. Now, a lot of times, though, these people are still hired. Why? Because maybe, maybe on paper, there's a person that looked cheaper, so you hired that person. Right? But just like uh, so many I talk about on here, a lot of times if you hire a company to help your business grow, and if the company's cheap, just because they're cheaper on paper, they're costing you hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost opportunities compared to the other one that was 2000 more a month on paper. That one that's 2000 more a month on paper is actually the one that's cheaper because they're helping you plug the leaky holes. They're helping you grow. They're helping you reduce employee headaches, reducing the, the, the need to hire and train and blah, blah, blah. So many things that we teach on here. The paper is lying to you. And it's the same way with from a pay scale standpoint. Some of you out there right now are nodding your heads. You're saying, yeah, I've got this girl named Judy. Uh, she's not that good at what they do. And the team doesn't like her that much either. And this is the person that falls into that lower left-hand corner, low performer, low trust. Then the total opposite spectrum is in the upper right-hand corner, right? This person is the high performer with high trust. This is the person that we all want, right? We all want the superstar athlete that also in the clubhouse helps make other people better, right? They're constantly working with their teammates to help them improve their career, help them improve how much money they're going to get to make the next time they sign the contract. They're working with, it's almost like another coach, right? They're working with them to help execute the playbook better. They're, they're working with them on some of their weaknesses to help improve their career in order to improve the team. This is the high performer, high trust. These are the people that you can't have enough of. You know, many podcasts ago, I taught you how to separate costs from investment, and you cannot lump those into the same category. I think that was the last episode of 2022, I believe, where we talked about how your accountant is sabotaging your success and how accountants do not have the ability to differentiate between what a cost is and what an investment is. And as an entrepreneur, you must be able to differentiate that, and you must have those on paper. Because you always want to be increasing your investments and reducing your costs. And part of that investment was your fixed investments, right? You have fixed investments, fixed, fixed, or excuse me, fixed investments and variable investments. So in your fixed investments would go your rock star employees. And those people are your high performers, high trust. When you're not looking, they're always doing the right thing, or at least they want to do the right thing. That you hire a consultant and they will do whatever it takes to make sure that consultant pays off for your business in the highest of ways. And again, they're always the one that says, hey, can I stay late and help you? Right? They're always in the mindset of improvement. They're always in the mindset of making other people better. The problem with the high performer, high trust person is in any organization, in any industry, is those people come very few and far between. So whenever the Navy SEALs Team 6, as an example, gets a high performer, high trust, this is that person that's got the confidence. They come with muscles. They come with the ability that maybe other people just don't have. They're coachable. right? They can get better, not only because they have the skill sets to get better, but they have a growth mindset because they want to get better. They are coachable. Right? If, if uh, somebody falls in the battlefield, they can get out there and yank that person off and save their life. So absolutely, the Navy SEALs Team 6, just like you, just like me, just like all of us as business owners, we should always be on the search for the high performer, high trust. But as all of you are probably thinking to yourself, and I know that I am, is that those people are so few and far between that it's unrealistic that you're going to have more than probably one of those in your organization if you're a small business owner. But again, this is why I teach you should always be interviewing. The interviewing process should never stop. You should always have stuff out there because you never know who you're going to get. You never know who's going to come across the wire, send in their resume that is maybe that high performer, high trust. And until you have those people inside your organization, you should never stop trying. 
right? You should never stop trying. The interviewing process should be a consistent process. And the Navy SEALs Team 6, that's why they're always looking at the Navy SEALs and other avenues to constantly be trying to find the high performer, high trust in this upper right-hand corner. But they, just like you and I, know that those people are few and far between. So now we've got the lower left-hand corner, the person that nobody wants. Unfortunately, you may be stuck with them sometimes, but nobody wants the low performer, low trust. Then we've got the upper right-hand corner. We've got high performer, high trust, the person that everybody wants. Now let's talk about what happens in the upper left-hand corner, right? The person that is a high performer, but a low trust. And this is one that I want to focus on quite a bit today, because this is the person that a lot of you have in your leadership roles, and you've got to change the mindset because they have no business being there unless they have a coachable trait that I'm going to talk about. Let's talk about the high performer, low trust. This is the person that is the superstar athlete. They are fantastic on the field, yet they bring down everybody else's performance because they're so bad inside the locker room. This is the person in your office, and you almost all out there have the person I'm about to describe. This is Judy, make-believe name, that is absolutely great with your patients, knows your protocols, but the team hates her, right? Nobody on the team likes her. She's a total pain in the ass to deal with in the lunchroom. She's constantly pissing people off, but inside your mind, you're justifying her job role there because she's good with her hand skills. She can set up trays. She knows your protocols. She knows how to get the sterilization room the way it needs to be. She knows scheduling, whatever it may be. She's great when patients are coming through the door, but the moment the game's over and you've got to go into the locker room, she sucks. And here's the problem with these people. See, the reason why a lot of you out there have that person, not only hired, a lot of times you out there, you have that person in a quote unquote leadership role, which again, they're not leaders at all. They're managers, they're bosses, they're in a position of power. And the reason that you have them there is there are metrics that you can put your finger on. It's like the person that is good at sales, right? And you can put your finger on, damn, this Joey guy Every single quarter when we submit numbers, he's consistently, if not always, ahead of everybody else. This guy is amazing. We need to promote him. Meanwhile, the, the infinite side of things, the stuff that you can't put your finger on, is that the reason why the rest of the sales team isn't doing as good as they could or they're doing really bad, really poorly, is because this Joey guy that you think is so good, he's driving down morale so much that it's driving down the performance of everybody else. Now, on paper, you look at Matt's uh, stats and you're like, okay, what the hell's wrong, Matt? Why aren't you doing your stuff right? And you look at Judy's stats and you say, Judy, why aren't you performing right? Your stats are low. They, but the reason they're low is because of this Joey guy. He's a complete asshole inside the locker room. He hurts the playbook. Like he is keeping other people from implementing your ideas, blossoming in their career. And I could go on and on and on. You all have this person inside your office. Patients like them, you kind of like them, and you like them because of the wrong reasons. They're good on the field, but the team hates them. This person not only cannot be employed at your office, but this person certainly cannot be put in a leadership role unless they do have a coachable trait. Now, normally these type people don't. These type people are very in it for themselves. You can't change their way of thinking. They're going to do whatever it takes to improve their numbers, but they don't give a damn about making other people better. And remember, everybody, one of the things that you have to remember about leadership is that your leadership people, their job is to make other people better. The high performer, low trust that we're talking about, these are the people, right, that, that keep everything inside their head because they've convinced themselves this is what makes them more valuable for your organization, right? And then you can't get rid of them. You're scared to death because 
uh, you know, again, all make believe names, you know, Barry, you know, he's got all this stuff buried in his head. And now you can't get rid of Barry because if you do, you're screwed because uh, nobody knows anything. It's all inside Barry's head. Unfortunately, this is how a lot of office managers look at it, right? I'm going to keep my job by keeping everything inside my head. That's a position of power. That is not a position of leadership. A position of leadership says, I'm going to get everything out of my head. It, 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 it teach that to everybody else in the office. Streamline that for everybody to make sure they're getting better at their career and advancing themselves forward to make more money, to get a promotion, etc. That's what a leader does. Obviously, amongst lots of other things. This is why, and again, a, a podcast for some time, talking about you know, the best way to get rid of the best people in your organization. And the best way is to keep people like I'm talking about, the high performers with low trust. Those people will absolutely kill your culture. It will kill the morale and the good people will leave you. If you're wondering why your turnover is high, these are the answers. Now, it's other things as well. But it's the people you have employed your organization. Just because they're good at what they do does not mean they deserve any kind of leadership role whatsoever. I talk to, to the right chat. You know, as right chat grows, you know, one of the, the challenges, and, and I tell everybody in the organization, this is a good challenge to have, right? There's good and bad ones. The bad challenge is, hell, we can't make money. We're going out of business. Uh, and there's other ones too. But a, but a good one is, hey, look, we're offering a really good service. Uh, we really care about the customer. People are coming aboard consistently. Okay, how do we keep the same quality as we scale up as we did when we had five customers? And that is a real, real commitment to excellence because it's hard. And it's why I don't think a lot of companies are very good as they scale because they lose the focus on the customer. And again, are we perfect? Of course we're not, but we sure as hell try to be. But as we scale up, I talked to the agents. I said, look, we're going to eventually be building teams. And the next promotion for you as an agent is to be running a team and interacting with the customer and training your own team and making sure that the, the people that you're answering for, the customers that you're answering for, that the customer retention is high. Like this is all stuff that we'll have visibility of that relates back to you in a role. And, and does part of the promotion to that leadership role, uh, do they need to at least know how to do the call and be good at it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't want them to suck at the call. Like, again, that goes back to low performer, low trust, right? They're not good with their team members and they're not good at the call. Now you ask yourself, what about the people that are, that are good at the, or, or good with their team members, not so good at the call? Well, I, it's not even my point of what I'm talking about right now, but that person I will take in a leadership role any day of the week. Like all of you out there, and I'm getting to this point on the Navy SEALs team six, all of you out there. You are so much better off having Susie, that's not so good of an assistant, be your lead assistant. That is such a different way and complete different mindset shift for so many of you out there. Because just because she's a good assistant doesn't mean she can make other people good. Doesn't mean she even gives a damn about making other people good. Doesn't mean she understands about how to create a vision. See, leadership is a trained skill set. So you ask yourself out there, you put somebody, I was saying earlier, this person that's great at sales, they get so much training to be great at sales. Now they're put in the most pos important position of their life and you don't have any training for it. It makes no sense. And so many of you out there do that. Betty, you've been here a long time. Good clinical assistant, good hand skills, blah, blah, blah. Now you're the leader. Uh, and she's totally lost because... She has no leadership skills. So it goes to her head. She's got the title, position of power. Now she's a boss, not a leader. You all know the story. But with the right chat agents, I am constantly pounding in their head. The ones that will get that leadership role are the ones that show the ability of high trust. The ones that we know they're going to do the right thing when they're not looking for the right reasons. The ones that are constantly saying, look, I will stay late. I won't even ask anything for it. The ones that are constantly helping their other team members thrive, wanting to help their other team members thrive. The ones that are curious, the ones that are coachable, 
These are the people inside Right Chat that will eventually run teams and make more money than they ever have in their entire career. Unfortunately, for a lot of you out there listening, these are not the people that you have hired in your leadership roles. You may have high performers, but you have low trust people in those positions. So now we have had the lower left-hand corner, which is low performer, low trust, that we all agree, who the hell wants that person? Then we've got the opposite, where everybody wants the high performer, high trust. Hard to find, not impossible, definitely hard to find, but something that you should be always on the lookout to find them. Then you've got the high performer with low trust. And again, this person represents, unfortunately, so many leadership roles out there because on paper, they were really good at what they did, but they destroyed everybody else on the team, lowered their morale. You know, I, I'll tell you a good example. This came to my mind, and, and I've told this story before, but this is, this is a great, I think this is the perfect way of looking at this. So... When I used to live in Humble, Texas, it's on the north side, about 10 minutes away from, from IAH, Bush Intercontinental Airport. And it's right next to where I grew up in, in Kingwood, Texas, uh, probably like a 10-minute drive from, from Humble to, to Kingwood. And over the years, I had a, a basketball group that we played in, and we would play 9, 12 hours a week, usually every Saturday morning for a good three hours. Great group of guys. I miss them because, you know, we moved away from that and then we moved again away from that to, to now in Colorado Springs. And I kind of lost that, that group of, uh, of that basketball group. And my, the way I play basketball, I, <laughs> I, I'm a good player, but I'm a very streaky player. And a, and a lot of my game depends on who I'm playing with. And, you know, I used to play with a group of guys that whenever I was on part of their teams. Like if you take our, our basketball group and we were going to play three on three as an example, half court basketball, three on three. There was a group of people that when I was partnered with, I didn't play very well, right? They, they were really good players, but they were selfish, high performers, low trust. They would, you know, hog the ball. They would not do other things to make other people better and my game very much is a, a low post game to begin with. And as I get going, it'll expand out. And as that confidence builds, if you get me the ball in the right place, I will score. And when I played with this team, they would not get me the ball in the right places. They would hog it. They would make decisions to benefit themselves, not the team overall. And it really hurt the way I played. Now, it didn't mean that we didn't win. Uh, sometimes, and they had good stats along the way. But they buried a lot of the other team members. And this was especially true when we did five-on-five five full court. But then you had this other group that when I was partnered with, they knew exactly where I wanted the ball and where I needed the ball to be successful. And they would take the time early on in every game to get me the ball to get going. And as I got going... Uh, the whole team started to flow and get better, et cetera, et cetera. And those players, though, were not as good as the other players that I was describing a minute ago that, that were more out for themselves and wouldn't get me the ball in the right places, ball hogged it, didn't make the right decision, made selfish decisions. So those people were better from a performance standpoint, worse from a trust standpoint. And the funny thing is, is that if you look back at our record, which we actually kept for a long time, we would actually keep the records and we would, you know, create these leagues and it was really fun. The players that, that I was talking about second ladder on the previous conversation were not nearly as good as the first ones I was discussing. But because we played together as a team, because there was a trust factor, because like if I missed a shot as an example, or if one of them missed a shot, we were like, hey, Byron was one of, was one of the one's names. They're like, Byron, hey, man, that's okay. Keep shooting it. Right? We would pick each other up, build each other's confidence. We defeated the teams that had better players very consistently, like at a 70 to 80% clip, like seven, like seven out of every 10 games, eight out of every 10 games, we would win and oftentimes win by a lot, even though they had better players. 
You take University of Michigan, as I do this, this podcast today, they just won the national championship not too long ago. And same way, if you look at the, the highest recruiting classes in college football for the past few years, Michigan is not on them. But they had an unrelentless trust for each other, an absolute impeccable culture to build each other up and go the extra mile. And even though they may have had some lesser talent, their trust was so much at a higher level than other teams they played that it made up for some of the lack of talent. Now, you can't have crap players, right? It's not like the team, not like the basketball players I was just talking about were, you know, were shitty. They're good players. They're just not nearly as good as the other ones that I played with. Same with Michigan. They have really good players. In some cases, they have great players. So again, it's not that they have crap, but the the different, you know, if, if, if they have a good player on their team going up against an exceptional player on another one, their good player is in a better position of winning because of the team and how unified their culture and their trust, et cetera, was. They would bring each other's game to a different level, higher than what maybe even their talent level was. Same way with the basketball group I played in. Those players, even though not as good, would bring my talent, my levels up to a different, higher level performance standpoint you know the excuse obviously and and i was saying a minute ago about how you drive out your best talent is by keeping people that are high performers low trust and the excuse is always right well i can't find anybody you know if i want to have a restaurant i've got to be able to have people to wait the tables even if they're not good and i get the argument But understand that keeping those people, no matter what you've told yourself, keeping those people inside your organization will always do more damage and make you work harder than just getting rid of them, period. Those people are tainting your culture like you cannot believe. And again, going back to, you say, well, you know, this person has such good hand skills or this person's so good at sales, Brian, or we've, you know, and and that goes for inside the orthodontic world. Uh, any other world for that matter. It could be, a, again, salesperson at your car dealership, whatever the hell. Like, boy, their numbers are always there. I, they're so good. Meanwhile, they're destroying the talents of everybody else and the abilities of everybody else. But you can't put your finger on that. Can't go to your practice management software or your business analysis data. Again, for companies out there that are listening to this outside of of uh, orthodontists, you can't go to your business data analysis. Nowhere on there is it going to say, Joey's good at sales, but Joey reduced Janice's sales by three this month, Chris's sales by five, uh, Bobby's sales by seven, and Anthony's sales by 10. Nowhere can you see that. So what do you do? You You put somebody into a leadership role because their stats say they're the best, that means they're a high performer, but the team hates them. Or maybe doesn't hate them, but you all know what I'm talking about. You all have this person. I've never been in a practice in my life where this type of person didn't exist. And this goes for the front, too. I'm using clinical leads a lot uh, as, as an example. This goes for the front, too. You have somebody that's great on the phones. They're great at greeting patients. Uh, they're happy. They're bubbly. But, man, when those patients aren't there, the team hates her guts. Right, or she just makes people mad, or she's constantly frustrating them. You all have this person, either in your clinical world, your your admin world, or maybe you have one of each. And again, this is the person inside the Navy SEALs, the high performer, that would have these big muscles, these amazing confidence, that could save lives on the battlefield, but you can't trust them with your wife. These people do not make it in the Navy SEALs Team 6. They certainly do not make it in the Navy SEALs Team 6 as a leadership role, and they cannot be a part of your organization out there either. Your practice, your business, whatever the hell you want to call it, you got to get rid of these people. And you can't put them into leadership roles. Just because they're a good clinical assistant does not qualify them in any way whatsoever to be in a leadership role. Just because they lead your sales team and sales out there does not qualify them to be in a leadership role whatsoever. Just like the best player in the NBA is not qualified to be a leader and a coach inside an organization. 
I know easier said than done. But these are the people that must get out of your organization and that you cannot put in leadership roles. So you're saying to yourself, Brian, who should go there? Like, who should I be looking for? Obviously, the high performer, high trust in that upper right-hand corner, right? No brainer. We all want that person. But let's talk about the other two, right? And now we're talking about on the far right, kind of in the medium or middle, excuse me. And then we've got the lower right-hand corner, right? So if you're watching on YouTube, you see the screenshots. You also see my hands, right? So you've got this. So now we're talking down here. And we've got the medium performer with high trust. And we've got the low performer with high trust. These are the people that the Navy SEALs Team 6 obsess over. This is who they go after. This is who they hire. This is who they keep. And there's very specific reasons for this that I want to dive into now. And continue to reshift what you're looking at from a hiring standpoint, who you keep, who you move in to leadership roles in your organization. Let's go back for a minute to the sports analogy. I like to look at the medium performer and the low performer as kind of that role player. And this is more for the medium performer than any of those. Let's talk, let's go back. Let's just talk medium performer high trust for a minute. This is that person that does get playing time. They can do, and you know, you have these in your organization, by the way. These are the people that they may not be as talented or they're probably not as talented as a superstar, the high performer. But they work harder than anybody. They will do whatever it takes to help you be a success. They are coachable. Now, they may not have the smarts and or the skill sets to take the coaching and become a high performer, but they're always trying. The team likes them. They help make the team better. If you need people to stay late, they're the first to volunteer. They're able to do different things in the office. Maybe they can answer the phones and also help you in the back clinically. Maybe they can TC, help you in the back clinically, right? Maybe they can do some marketing and also do another position in your office, whatever it may be. You know the person I'm talking about, and these people are invaluable. The Houston Rockets many years ago in the, mid, in the mid-90s in their dynasty era, back in the Elijah Wan and, and Drexler days, This is a perfect example of when they were winning championships, they had an amazing supporting cast. Mario Eli, Robert Ori, Sam Cassell, Kenny Smith, Otis Thorpe. Uh, For the first championship, Otis was there. Second one, he wasn't. And their two championships, they had amazing supporting cast. A lot of medium performer, high trust people. They made other people better. And they also played their role at a very high level. But then those players got traded away for another superstar, Charles Barkley. Now, they were also older, so they weren't as high performers, Drexler, Elijah Wan, and Barkley. But also a lot of the role players that were so integral in the first couple championships, those role players were gone. They did not have a lot of medium performers on that team. They had high performers and they had low performers. Not a lot of medium performers. And it hurt them bad. Bad. So you all know this person. This person may be the person up front answering the phones that they're just not smart enough or talented enough to be great at it. But man, they try. And they really help the organization in multitude of different ways. And the team really likes them. This is your medium performer in high trust. And these are the people that become really, really good coaches in sports. Really good coaches in sports. These are the people that you should be looking at whenever you need a leadership position in your office. Again, The Navy SEALs Team 6 also knows what I'm about to say. This is why they look for these people. Is that usually medium performers 
and high trust people are coachable. They want to learn. They want to get better, not only for self-improvement, but they know if they improve themselves, they're going to be able to improve other people, which is what a leader is. They're curious. They want to learn, like I just said, which is a big part of what leadership is. I did a podcast many seasons ago that talks about what's the one word. If you want to know if someone's going to be a good leader, what's the one word to look for? It's curiosity. You can't put people in leadership roles that aren't curious. You know, are that maybe they're curious because they're trying to, to find better ways of doing it than how they're doing it now. Whatever it may be, curious people make really good leaders. Because curious people, again, leadership is a trained skill set. It is not something that you can just put somebody in a leadership role and say, go get them, Judy. It is a trained skill set. And a reason why we've been trying to launch this for a while, the whirlwind's got us, but on the new patient group side, we're opening up a big Slack channel and creating a mastermind for the leadership roles in all of our offices. Because we want to have sessions training them on leadership and teaching them how to handle conversations and how to make other people better. And and again, coaching things on what leaders do. They make other people better. They have tough conversations. They hold people accountable. They're on the floor monitoring. I, I, I love this whole, yeah, um, I'm an office manager. And, and this is where if office managers listen to this. I think it's unfair because, and I have podcasts dedicated to this exact topic at some point. I think it's unfair what people do to you inside offices. It's like, yeah, I'm an office manager. I sit in an office all day long. Like I can't stand the title. Like your title should be chief leadership officer. That should be your title. Because that is your job. Your job is not to babysit and manage the practice management software and sit inside a desk or behind a desk all day and close doors. That's not what great leaders do. You know, you look at high-end restaurants, what do the managers do? They're on the floor. They're shaking the hands of customers. They're going to tables to make sure everything's okay. They're going around to their wait staff to make sure the wait staff has the tools they need to be great. They are uh, you know, helping. If the waiters are shorthanded, the managers step in and help. Like Whatever it may be, they're on the floor. They're making people better. But what do office managers do in a lot of your offices out there? They sit in a room. And that usually I don't think is their fault. That's just a job description that it's always kind of been. And that's a job description you're handing them. And that is totally mismanaging what that job role is. That job role, again, is to make other people better. It's to advance the business forward. It's to take where you are today, be better tomorrow. It's constant change, implementing change, helping you implement your ideas and strategies. It's a COO. It's a chief operational officer. Doctors listening out there, if you have an office manager, they are your COO. A COO's main responsibility is to make sure the vision of the CEO is getting implemented. The CEO is the visionary. The CEO is the idea person. The CEO is is a person that's looking to tomorrow and five years from now. The other people's jobs in the organization are usually not that. That's the COO's job. But oftentimes, a lot of the quote-unquote leaders and a lot of your offices out there, they're the ones that have the fixed mindset. They're the ones putting the stops on all the new ideas. They're the problem. Again, high performer, low trust. And like I said, tons of podcasts around that little tangent (laughs) in the future. Medium performer, high trust. You all know who these people are. Those are people, just like I talked to the right chat people, those are the people that should be next in line for your promotions. Not the high, well, the high performer, high trust, of course, but not the high performer, low trust. If the team doesn't trust them, they can't be in a leadership role, period. High performers, high trust, again, those are the people that you've got to get rid of in your organization, period. They can't last. Well, Brian, I can't find anybody. I get it. You do it. You suck it up for three months and add assisting duties to your calendar because that other person is hurting your organization more by keeping them than getting rid of them. Low performer, high trust bottom right-hand corner. See, the Navy SEALs Team 6 are sitting there looking 
at themselves and they're saying, look, let's take make believe name Mike. And Mike comes in and Mike is a scrawny guy, not really any muscle, doesn't have a lot of confidence. Okay. Most people on the surface would be like, oh, no way. Mike's not making the Navy SEALs team six. He's out. And this is why so many of you have the wrong people in your leadership roles. Because what you're forgetting is, is that Mike can be put on a weight gaining program. Mike can work with the professional trainers and put on muscle. Mike can learn and be coached around self-confidence. Those are coachable traits. And when you're high trust, you're a person that's coachable. You will work your ass off. You will do what it takes to get better. But you will also do those things because it's going to help improve other people. So the high trust people can be coached to be high performers. They can be developed to be high performers. These are other podcasts at some point. You know, the, the failure of a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs out there is the lack of development of their people. Right? You hiring people you know, that have been around for 20 years... Just because they've done it before, again, doesn't mean they're high trust, doesn't mean they're coachable, doesn't mean they're curious, doesn't mean they're going to not, you know, it doesn't mean they're not going to come in and and toxify your culture. This is why you've got to look for high trust people and you've got to coach them to be a success. You have to develop them both in life and career. It's a big part of what we commit to with Right Chat. I'm having the agents as I do this podcast today, the agents are going through a life exercise. Why? Well, because I want to develop them into the best they can possibly be. And along the way, when I do that, I know who the high trust people are and who the ones that aren't. And the ones that aren't, they're out. I don't care how good they are in the new patient call. They will not answer phones for my organization because they're not high trust. Period. So a lot of times what you do out there is you take the low performer And you get rid of them. You say they're not good or they don't have enough experience or they're making mistakes or whatever it may be. And you say this person's got to go. Meanwhile, the team really likes them. They work really hard. You know, they show up on time. They rarely call in sick, like, et cetera. All these things, right, that are the off the battlefield type of things they're really good at. But your head is so in the weeds on stats and what you can put your finger on, that you're getting rid of these people that actually, if you would just commit to hiring coaches and consultants and the right people to come in to help you, these people will blossom into some of the best employees you could possibly imagine. This is why oftentimes when we're brought in with new patient group, you know, we're told by the doctor, we have several just meetings with them. And part of it's like, okay, here's somebody I think is really good. You're going to like a lot. Here is a one or two people that they're not doing very good. I don't know how long they're going to stay. And then six months goes by and guess what? The person we were told that was really good, they end up being the high performer, low trust, right? They're good today because they get to do whatever they want. But the second you challenge them and try to make them better, they go to hell, they fight it, they, they piss off the whole team, they put the stop gaps in everything we try to do. And the next thing you know, that's your worst employee. Meanwhile, you've get the, the high trust people, the medium and low performers, consistent ongoing training around things. And because they've got high trust, they take it and they blossom their career and they blossom into people that you never thought they were because you didn't coach them. You didn't train them. You didn't develop them. And as they blossom, yes, they get better at what they do. Do they become a high performer? Sometimes, but I would say usually they hover right. If they're a medium performer, they go medium plus. You know, if they're a low performer, yeah, we get them to medium or medium plus, but they're so trusted by the team. They work so damn hard. They'll do whatever it takes uh, to implement what we want. They'll do whatever it takes uh, for our online marketing team to implement uh, the vision that we have in combination with yours. Uh, they'll, they'll do whatever it takes to help your organization thrive. They bring the culture together. They make their players better, just like the basketball team I played with made me better. So even though they may not be as good as practice Joe down the street from a, from a performer standpoint, you're so unified that any idea that you have comes to fruition and you kick ass. These are the people, everybody, that need to be in your leadership roles. Kind of a subtopic 
that again will be a podcast today too, is that remember, just because Janice is in a clinical lead doesn't mean she knows the first thing about leadership, how to coach, how to set a vision of how the back should run. Again, how to hold people accountable, have the difficult conversation, how to provide a review, how to monitor, take notes, provide feedback, train. I could go on and on and on. Coach, create a playbook. So if you want managers and bosses, keep doing it the same way. If you want true leadership in your organization where people are doing it because they're helping, of course, themselves, but helping other team members thrive and ideas get implemented and you've got a team full of yes people with a growth mindset, not a stopgap mindset, fixed mindset, you've got to hire for trust, train to performance and high trust people are trainable and they will get better. They will get better. And you may look at it, oh, that's a lot of work. It's actually way less work because so many of you know out there, your leaders aren't leaders. It doesn't take things off of your plate. It adds things to your plate. If there were real leaders, they would get things running smoothly to the point where you could work and stress less as a business owner. Those are leaders. But you have to rethink how you've always done this, everybody, because it is a shift. But it's a shift that the best of the best do. The apples of the world, they utilize this hiring strategy, this promotion strategy that I'm talking about today. Of course, there's other very well-known companies that do the same thing. But you have to remember that stats lie. I teach it for a living. Stats lie that you can you pop out of your practice management software, but stats also lie when it comes to, I got a great treatment coordinator. She's got an X and X conversion rate. She makes us so much money. Meanwhile, my other six employees can't stand her. She drives down their performance. And I wonder why my clinical staff isn't doing very well. My front desk staff morale, people are calling in sick. They don't want to show up. It's a blah atmosphere. Guess what? It's because of the TC that you think so great is a high performer, low trust person. If they are a low trust person, they must leave your office. And at minimum, you cannot put these people in a quote unquote leadership position because if you do, you're going to create a position of power, of rank, and of bossmanship. And that is not how to be a leader. Rethink it, everybody, because if you do, you're going to be running it like the famous companies. Never stop looking for high performers, high trust but they don't exist a lot out there. Doesn't mean you can't find them. You should look for them, but be constantly focusing around high trust people. And if they're not, you got to get them out of your organization. No matter how hard it may be, they've got to go. Rethink it all. Again, thanks to OrthoFi for being our sponsor here in March. Don't forget that great offer from them. If you're a practice that's struggling in any of those areas that I talked about before, Go ahead and give them a try. Now's the chance. Get $3,500 off uh, their implementation fee. Look in the podcast description for all the great things we have coming up. That part, that promotion that OrthoFi is offering, our OrthoFi workshop that I'm going to be doing with with Oliver. You are going to love it. I expect to see all of our podcast listeners in that audience. And look forward on March 21st for Dr. Bob Skopak and I's fireside chat, the very first one we're going to be doing. Make sure to click that link and register. And remember, everybody, we've got MPG Iconic coming up in September. We are only taking a few more practices. All right, this is a private event. This is not something that's got a bajillion people there. This is a private event to move your needle forward for two plus days. Make sure you and your team come. I'm going to have that registration link in there as well. Thanks, everybody, for your support. And until April, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.